Well, welcome to you all, and in particular to friends and family of um, our inaugural lecturer this evening, um, Professor Daniel Morris Burney. You are most sincerely welcome, and what a lovely evening to uh, uh, host you here. Um, I, I was saying to Dan when we were chatting just yesterday that uh, th our inaugural lectures are really, I think, the academic highlight of being part of an institution like this. They are a great celebration both for personal achievement uh, and I think it is quite right and fitting to make sure that there is, this is the moment when we do recognise that in that personal achievement has usually been and in fact always is the support of many individuals and it's wonderful to see so many of Dan's friends and colleagues uh, here to support him this evening. Um, that said, of course, uh, Dan is well known to, I think, everyone in the audience, uh, and that's, part of, that's in part because, um, with all due respect, he's been part of the fabric here over an extended period of time. Uh, and again, I think that uh, uh, speaks very well of uh, Dan's commitment to the legacy institutions, um, both the Royal London and uh, BART's, uh, now of course all parts of, part of BART's health as an NHS trust, and of course um, its association with St. Bartholomew's and the London, BART's and the London's Medical School and School of Dentistry. Um, you will know, of course, that Daniel uh, started his career and academic career uh, at Cambridge and then for some reason found himself at another medical school. I allow aberrations in most people's career trajectory at some point, but there was, a, 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 I gather, a medical school a little to the west of here, uh, uh, and, um, which of course, half of, now, half of which has now been knocked down, uh, probably quite appropriately. Um, but then Daniel made probably the key and right decision to uh, start his training in histopathology uh, here at the Royal London initially, and then it seems to have been oscillating between the Royal London and Barts um, throughout the re remainder of uh, his, both his training and, of course, the duration of his uh, uh, clinical uh, consultant uh, uh, career. He was appointed as an honorary senior lecturer at Queen Mary University of London um, in 2000. Uh, and actually, I think that speaks very well for uh, uh, his achievements. It spoke uh, not only of his contributions to uh, education and teaching, learning, but, but of course it was an early indication of the research trajectory that has uh, subsequently characterised uh, Daniel's career. Um, he was promoted to uh, an honorary reader position um, in 2007, and of course we were, we were delighted when he was further promoted to a full chair, honorary chair at Queen Mary. Um, later in 2012-2013. So we've been anxious to uh, invite Daniel to give his inaugural lecture for a little while. He's been busy with a number of um, events in his life, but I think this is uh, the occasion when we can celebrate with Daniel um, his achievements in both research and teaching over that extended period of time. And I'm sure we'll hear much of some of the things that he plans to do in the future. So um, he's offered us a rather intriguing title this evening, uh, uh, and I suspect it's that that's brought many of you here. Um, Gleason, Aisha, Bark, Strange Loops in Prostate Cancer. Daniel, we look forward to your lecture. Thank you very much uh, for that warm introduction, and, and it's an honour to have so many of you here. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for coming. Um, so, uh, in an uh, inaugural lecture, it, it's it's I think traditional to speak uh, a little about yourself. So, so this is where I come from. This is this is Portsmouth um, in all its glory. Um, my mother's house where is, is just about there, where I I, I I was virtually born and bred, and she's still there. And uh, and this is what it's like. And uh, we've got some great sites there. I was, volunteer, I was a volunteer guide there for a while. My mother is a volunteer guide. Some of you in the audience were at my 40th on the, on the warrior there. Um, and uh, so this is Portsmouth now. Portsmouth in the 70s uh, looked a bit like this. Uh, this is the Tricorn Centre, thankfully now demolished. It was 
uh, full of bomb sites and not quite as an attractive city uh, as it is as it is now. Um, to start at the beginning, um, I arrived somewhat late, um, uh, three weeks late, I believe, and um, at ten pounds. Uh, I ha have not grown much since the joke's been made. Um, uh, that's my, my mother and my, uh, my sister, my older sister, both both in the audience, and, and this is uh, me with my, my other other sister, uh, Sarah, who we'll talk about in, in a second. Um, in the 70s, unfortunately, dress sense was not in the cards. Um, I still, my sister's wedding is my page boy outfit in a rather uh, polyester brown suit with a peach polo neck. It was apparently the height of fashion in 1977. Uh, but, but, but there we go. Um, and uh, if you're wondering, it, it, those of you in pathology and you need to have good sight, if you're wondering which of these two small boys is me, then I can offer you some clues here. Um, you'll notice this here, and you'll notice the socks halfway down, and not this smart boy there. Well, I'm afraid that one of my colleagues called this the Bernie sign uh, in, in the department, so apologies. I hope I'm slightly uh, better dressed today. Uh, and I uh, grew up as a part of the a big uh, inbuilt Jewish community um, in Portsmouth. Um, I inherited absolutely none of the belief, but all of the associated guilt and angst that goes with being. <laughs> uh, and um, and um, uh, this is the school I went to. It looks lovely, doesn't it? We've got balloons outside. It looks, it looks a really nice place. I can see Tim, who's been with me since, since I was eight, started at this school here. And the reality of Portsmouth Grammar School was a bit like this. We had compulsory boxing. We had a compulsory cadet force, which we all had to join. And, and this was the, the, the rather forbidding rugby team you wouldn't want to meet uh, in my year. Uh, for those of you who, who, who might be spotters, he's, he's a, a Sky a TV presenter, Mike Wedderburn. Uh, that's the, just resigned as head of Ofcom, Ed Richards. And that's Roger Black. Uh, who's a 400 metre runner who won a silver, silver medal about 20, 20 years ago, the head boy of our year. So academic excellence was not necessarily prized at my school <laughs> as much as sporting prowess. And my sporting prowess, well, it's best left to your imagination. <laughs> um, so to be slightly serious for a while, I think this sort of happy upbringing was, was slightly shattered in 1980-81. Uh, this is uh, the younger of my two sisters, uh, Sarah, who's 13 years older than me, and uh, daughter Louise, who is now 34. Unfortunately, when I was in my O-level year, um, my sister developed metastatic uh, malignant melanoma and uh, died only eight months after this picture was taken. Um, and you can imagine the results of that. I think my mother often asks me uh, whether that is the reason I'm standing here today? And the answer to that is yes and no. I don't think it encouraged me into oncology in particular. But what it did make me do as a reaction was to shut myself into uh, my room and work bloody hard. <laughs> and so that, I think, is really uh, why I managed to get as far as I could. I'm sure, I'm sure some of my school colleagues would, will, will uh, say I was nothing special academically at the, uh, in the lower school in the earlier years. Um, and one of the books I read that inspired me into science at this stage when I was 16 or 17 is this one. It's called Gödel Escher Bach, uh, An Eternal Golden Braid, A Metaphorical Fugue of Minds and Machines in the Spirit of Lewis Carroll. And it's very difficult to understand. I have read it, but I must say, not all, I don't understand all of it, but it is a fantastic book on um, the processes of science and machines told in, in, in a really strange way, drawing together these three characters. And I want to talk about my um, academia, uh, going through it slightly with you. This is um, Escher, as you can see, and this is a, a MOBA strip, a strip that goes on endlessly in a loop, as you can see here. And it was my sister, my, my older sister, Jo, who first introduced me to, to Escher's work. And the concept I want to introduce you is a strange loop. A strange loop arises when, by moving upwards or downwards through a hierarchical system, one finds oneself back where one started in the first place. And this is an example, you might think of a, of a strange loop, two hands drawing each other from one of Escher's drawings. And the more classical one is these men trudging up and down this stairway in, in an endless uh, and fascinating uh, rotation. So after all this work, I ended up at uh, Jesus College, Cambridge, 
Uh, this is called the chimney. Um, it is home actually to quite a, a number of, uh, uh, of, of u urologists. We, we can actually form our MD MDT. We've got Chris Parker, a, a radiologist at um, a, a, a clinical oncologist, sorry, at um, uh, the Marsden, and um, and Tim O'Brien, a surgeon at the um, at, at Guys and Tommies, uh, went through here, and and, uh, and Jesus College lived to tell the tale. For any of you who knew Tim, it knows Tim O'Brien. Um, so I had a great time there exploring uh, medicine. I remember uh, introducing my own strange loop in pathology there when I fell asleep in a lecture, and uh, or not in a, in a tutorial. And the tutor and the guy turned to me and said, "What did you think of that, Dan?" And I looked and woke from my reverie, and I looked him straight in the eye and said, "Well, it's a chicken and egg problem, really, isn't it?" And he said, "You're exactly right." <laughs> <laughs> Went on. I've still got no idea what the problem was, but strange loops can be strangely useful to one at times. Um, so at college, I, I, I got my first interest in, in music and was introduced to the music of the second part of, of, of or the third part of Godelisha Bach, which is, which is called Bach's music. And I think if Bach had been born today, he would have been a, a scientist, a code breaker possibly. He had a way of dealing with maths and coding um, his music in an extraordinary way. Um, and through this music, I have gone through a couple of choirs, but I'm currently uh, with a, a lovely choir called City Chamber Choir, and uh, you can hear them play at the moment some of uh, Bach's music, which I've kindly been able to upload successfully. Here's pictures of the choir. You see, I've, I've muscled my way to the front of that picture very successfully there. Poor conductor's struggling at the back there. He's, he's in the audience today. So it's lovely to have uh, some of uh, choir members here uh, in the audience. And um, we're singing actually some Bach uh, next year. We're actually singing Handel in our next concert. I hope some handbills went out. But Bach introduces strange loops into his music. He often goes through the keys to start off where you finished at the beginning at an octave higher and does amazing things with uh, music in that way. So the third person is Kurt Girdle, who is the key really. And unfortunately, there are mathematicians in the audience much cleverer than me. Some off to Belarus shortly on maths Olympiads. Um, and um, Gödel's basic uh, theory was that in any formalised mathematical system will never be perfect. There will always be proofs that you can't show and things uh, that you can't disprove. And so a completely consistent system is not possible in mathematics. And I believe that's true in the whole of science as well. And this is uh, where we come to uh, scientific, scientific talk. We know this sort of classic diagram of DNA and RNA and protein. Whereas in fact, uh, it, what really happens we now know is there's a huge amount of interaction between DNA and RNA protein. In fact, we've got loops here before we even start. And if you think about how uh, people evolved or cells evolved from this primitive soup, when you've got these three things interacting, it's almost possible to conceive the elements in this diagram are so interactive with each other. So this is a sort of strange loop in, in biology. Um, I've also, Richard, are we pleased that he passed over in my lecture my, my residence west of here. So um, I'm passing over my clinical aspect at UCL, though I did enjoy myself at the Middlesex in particular on the HIV wards there. Mm -hmm. And um, in 1990, I was employed uh, by uh, Colin Berry at the Royal London Hospital. And um, as said, I bounced between Barts and London. And I've been bouncing backwards and forwards between these two institutions on a on virtual daily basis um, ever since. And uh, to those of you who don't know, this is the sort of thing I look at every day of my life. Uh, this is, in fact, a thyroid cancer. And I owe a lot to the pathologists who taught me and worked with me. And I'm sure, despite the eminence of, of, of all of the pathologists in the audience, they'll, they'll uh, uh, let me apologize if I just uh, talk about one who is Chris Brown, who was my first real teacher in pathology. Um, also, he's very appropriate to this lecture because um, Chris, unfortunately, passed away from prostate cancer uh, two years ago. And so, despite the research I do, does have a practical basis and an emotional basis in the fact that my own uh, mentor uh, did, did die from the disease. Um, pathology is about, if Chris was here, he'd tell you, for instance, that in, in this tumour here, the actual crucial aspect of this slide is, in fact, this small little red blob here. 
just to show you uh, how pathology, close attention to detail, is necessary. And that is why, really, all pathologists are completely obsessive-compulsive. We're all completely wrapped up on ourselves, and you need to be completely OCD to do the job, and I, I'm afraid I, I fit the bill fairly well from, from that score. So um, I've got to introduce some formal science to this lecture, so I'd like to obviously talk about how prostate cancer relates to these strange uh, loops I've shown you. Prostate cancer is uh, a, an amazing, uh, weird disease. You can see uh, this is the incidence of the disease in every country, and that's the mortality. Well, if you look in the UK, we have this as an incidence, and about a four times more uh, a quarter of uh, people die from the disease who have it. In China, it hardly exists at all. In the USA, you've got this huge incidence and fairly standard mortality comparable to that of the UK. And of course, the difference between the incidence and the mortality can be misused because the problem is the harder you search for the disease, the more you'll find and the more that you'll find that do nothing in your lifetime. And this is exemplified very well by one attacker of our beloved health service, Rudy Giuliani, who said, my chance of surviving prostate cancer, and thank God I was cured of it, in the United States, 88%. My chance of surviving prostate cancer in England, only 44% under socialised medicine. Which shows a complete misunderstanding of statistics, because they're overlooking in the States, finding disease cancers that never do anything in their lifetime. So prostate cancer is a major pro cancer problem worldwide. And to be honest, we have no idea which is the best method of diagnosis. We have no idea which ones we should treat. And we have no idea which treatment method is best. And if anyone tells you anything different, they're telling porkies. Because we, especially in the early stage disease, we really have little idea uh, what the best method is. And our basic problem is this. Prostate cancer could be one of two things. It can be a pussycat or it can be a tiger. And when it's a tiger, it's very bad news and because it's a common disease. It does kill a lot of people in this country. But there's far, far more that are merely pussycats and you can live with. So cancer covers a spectrum of very, very indolent to very, very nasty uh, disease. Uh, to wake you all up in the audience, I'll remind you of the best way to treat prostate cancer, and that is to castrate yourself uh, before puberty. This is an anatomical preparation of the external genitalia of a Skopje man. Skopjes believed that Christ would ascend to heaven when 100,000 of them had self-castrated themselves and also performed an auto-amputation of the penis. I had to put a gory picture in here somewhere. It wasn't a set that ever really took off, it must be said. <laughs> but but it, it, is one good, it is one good way to cure yourself of ever having prostate cancer, is, is, is castration. And it also uh, exemplifies the fact, uh, also brings me to the point that, of course, the second string to my bow, apart from, apart from uh, GU pathology, is, of course, endocrine pathology. And about uh, 20 years ago, uh, Professor Lowe in the audience uh, told me that it was my turn, I had to do the endocrine MDT and I had to do an endocrine MDT under the fearsome Professor Besser and he said, but don't worry, he said, because he doesn't know any pathology. <laughs> so uh, I was very, very lucky that uh, he was there, I hope Prof isn't here. Uh, he, he was vaguely right in that, in that I was able to bluff my way nicely, and, I, and I'm still bluffing my way in the endocrine meeting to this day. Uh, but I, I do enjoy my endocrine days out. Now, at this point, the other person I had a lot of contact with uh, in the early days at, at the London was uh, this man. And uh, when, when I turned up to an MDT, um, I remember one of my colleagues saying to me, you've got to watch out, he's tricksy. And uh, this is, is Tim Oliver. Uh, Tim Oliver is um, a person who doesn't so much think out of the box as thinking an entirely different planet. He comes out with new ideas um, every century. I don't think he's here, un unfortunately, as, um, as uh, someone, someone said to me uh, uh, just now, and he'll probably turn up at this time tomorrow if I know, <laughs> if I know Tim very well. But anyway, in the 90s, um, Tim Oliver met a, a very, was treating a very uh, sick patient with uh, testis cancer who is in the audience. And uh, there's a picture of him in his diving gear there. 
And um, Colin Osborne, I'm delighted he's in the audience, uh, promised him that he'd set up a, a charity uh, to support his work in genitourinary male cancers. And therefore, this cancer, Orchid, uh, was born. And uh, they are the main reason I am standing here today, because without Orchid's strong support of the work that I do, and Tim's vision to know that pathology was important and a translational tissue bank was important, uh, I certainly wouldn't be here. And I'm very grateful to it. Well, the last name I've got on the list that I need to mention to you is Donald Gleason. You'll have seen in the title. Well, Donald Gleason, um, I did meet once. He died about six years ago, and he found out a way to grade prostate cancer for how nasty it is. He devised this system in the 60s, and I can tell you that even after 40 years, the best current clinical way we use to grade prostate cancer and say how nasty it is, is by the Gleason system. And he used a pattern-based system, uh, and this little pattern of tumours is plastered on thousands and thousands of pathology departments throughout the country. And to explain to the non-clinicians here that this is the, the grade one, and this is grade five, with grade five being nasty and one being quite indolent cancer. And he decided what he'd do is he'd choose the two different areas of cancer, because some cancers have different patterns in them. And you'd give it a first score and a second score to end up with a score that goes between two, one plus one being the best score you can get, two up to five plus five equals ten, with all these intermediate scores there. So the score runs from two to ten. And this is how I think neurologists sometimes see us, see us giving scores out, as it's this Gleason score and that's what it is and there's, there's no alternative. And I wish it was as simple as that, but it's not. There's a lot of slips between cup and lip and a lot of variation between pathologists and a lot of drift in pathological grading, which is what I, I want to talk about. Now, definitions of what we called cancer began to change about five, six years ago. Um, Jonathan Epstein wrote a number of articles. He's a, uh, a very important uh, uh, scientist at John Hopkins. And I chipped in with, with my bit as well about six years ago as well. And so we decided to change slightly the grading system of prostate cancer. But we, we just changed the patterns without changing the scores that we used. And this uh, gave rise to a number of problems. First of all, this was uh, the scores of original gradings back in 20 years ago. And we were drifting to the right of this diagram. And people weren't giving the low scores anymore. There are multiple reasons for that. But people basically realized that most of these low score cancers were benign or uh, were, were entirely benign and not cancers at all. And otherwise, we realized they behaved just the same as the fives and sixes. So there's been a drift to the right of this diagram here in our scores that we give for prostate cancer. And this is where we come to really the strange leaps in prostate cancer, because we have to be very careful what we say. Because if you treat yourself as giving a Gleason score in tablets of stone, then you can have a self-justifying pathologist. You diagnose Gleason on your biopsy, you look at when the tumour, when it comes out, and because you think it's uh, looks the same, you diagnose the same thing. There's no proof that that is, helps in defining whether a patient dies or not. You, you're self-justifying yourself. And I think there are a number of, dare I say, I'm being slightly challenging here, uh, self-justifying clinicians in the audience as well. There are problems in the, the fact that early diagnosis is er, always better, and pushing the diagnosis to diagnose more and more of these tumours is not necessarily the best thing to do for these patients, despite the calls from CRUK for early diagnosis all the time. And uh, the Will Rogers effect I'll mention briefly. Will Rogers was, was an American comedian who told a joke that is hysterical to Americans uh, which is uh, that when the Okies moved to uh, California, the IQ of both states went up, which is, which is hysterical if you're American, but goes less down with the British <coughs> audience. But basically, <laughs> basically, the issue is that if you shift between grades, things happen. For instance, if you've been a, a, a urologist working for the last 20 years, your survival curves have dramatically gone up, you've got and you think you've got better at doing your job. You haven't got better at doing your job at all. It's just that we've changed the goalposts that you're doing. So uh, there are a number of sort of strange loops that occur in prostate cancer. The third one is sort of uh, the scientific problem of biomarker data. Uh, and often biomarker data is used with pathological surrogates. And by that, I mean you compare your biomarkers with the Gleason score and how aggressive it looks and say, isn't that superb? 
Whereas you haven't got much outcome data to work with. And the reason you haven't got much outcome data with work is prostate cancer takes a long time to sort out. If I started a study today, I wouldn't get a study with outcome death for 20 years. And that's a long time to wait for any study. So you've got to go back in time to look at your studies rather than forward in time. And um, one of the things in the Gleason Ishabach is, is he uses Alice in Wonderland a lot. It's really like uh, what the Red Queen says to Alice in, in Wonderland, which is uh, to stay in the same place, you've got to run as fast as you can. And we're running very fast in prostate cancer to sometimes very little effect. It's a big problem. Um, and about... Uh, I think 1617 years ago, uh, Tim Oliver um, introduced me to this man who is in the audience, uh, Professor Kuzik. And uh, he set up the, what's called the Transatlantic Prostate Group to examine this problem. He agreed with this problem in that we needed people, we need a long-term cohort of prostate cancers, which was big, so it would be statistically relevant. It, it was people who had clinical follow-up but weren't treated radically. They were basically observed rather than treated by any radical means, because we know those ones are going to do well. And he realised they'd have to be diagnosed to modern standards. So he first got in touch with a few pathologists at a hospital to the west of here, and they'd have nothing to do with him, as I remember. And uh, then he got in touch with Chris Foster, and, uh, who's also in the audience, and uh, I think they both decided they needed an idiot. An idiot who was completely prepared to Gleason grade 1,600 cancers. <laughs> Uh, and they found that idiot, didn't they? <laughs> so he also had the vision to know that we needed translational material that was available. And um, a lot of work was done by a lot of people, Gabrielle, Henrik, um, in the audience, in, in gathering the data through the cancer registries to gather uh, this amount of cases of prostate cancer. And this is the, the first paper that was uh, public, we published on this subject, long-term outcome men men with conservatively treated localised prostate cancer. And what we showed was the low Gleason score ones did very well, and the high Gleason score ones did very badly. But this was, for me, this was fantastic, because it was actual proof that my Gleason grading was actually working, and that what we do as a pathologist actually did have a huge effect on patients rather than just doing it in thin air, which is what we really do uh, most days of the week, unfortunately, without much uh, feedback. So what can we do with this material? Well, we can do a lot. You can take little samples of these tissues and put them in a donut block. And if you take a little sample like this, you end up with tiny little wells of tissue. And you can do a host of experiments on this tiny well. So if this is one transatlantic block, um, I can show you the scale of the problem. In fact, there were considerably more than that. There were about that number of transatlantic blocks. So if you consider from each of those blocks of tissue, you can take 200 or so slices that look like that to do an experiment, and you begin to realise the scale of the size of the problem we have to deal with and the number of samples we have to analyse to get uh, good data. And so we've spent a lot of work on that over the past few years. And some of it's been successful, uh, some of it's been uh, less successful. I want to talk about a couple of the things I'm proudest of uh, and the translational work in this study. Uh, this, is, this was uh, the work on Key67. Key67, for those of you who don't know, is basically a marker of how cells proliferate. And uh, it actually stratifies very well. For those of you who don't know, this is what's called a Kaplan-Meier curve. You've got time along there. You can see it goes up to 10 years here. Not 20, but would, would have 20 year outcome now. And uh, this is survival. So if you go on this curve, uh, most people are dying. And if you're going on this curve, then most people are living. So just my, me looking at down a microscope and saying what the key 67 was is hugely predictive of patient outcome. Um, some things were less successful. And as I'm being photographed, I'm slightly loath to talk too much about this one. Uh, but uh, the trouble is when one works with uh, biotech companies, one doesn't know what one's going to come up with uh, next. And uh, we've had one very successful biotech company I'm going to talk about in a minute. But this was a, a complete flop in that uh, they promised the earth. They marketed themselves as 233 better percent of Gleason. They had an image analysis that they called magic, which just about says it all in advanced mathematics. And they came up with diddly squat and basically uh, went broke. 
I think is all I'm uh, prepared to say at the moment in front of a camera. But uh, we'll tell you more over a Prosecco, or Professor Kuzik will. Um, on the upside, I think the substantial progress we've made is particularly with another biotech company uh, called Myriad Genetics, who are based in Salt Lake City. And they've based another marker, uh, not looking down the microscope, but basically looking at RNA, that sort of intermediate stage between DNA and protein, which basically is a signature of how cells are proliferating as well, how fast they're growing. And uh, they did a fantastic uh, study on the transatlantic material, which basically was the only study I've seen that wiped Gleason off the map. It is better than Gleason. Uh, this obviously is being marketed at the moment, and it's being marketed as a test called Prolaris. There's another test also on the market that's out that hasn't used our data from another company. Uh, but we'll see where this goes. Uh, there's certainly more work that we've uh, shortly to publish, which shows the strength of this as a test for prostate cancer and how aggressive it's going to be. And um, I got into terrible trouble for saying this at a pathology specimen, but if I said, I'll say it here, if I ever had prostate cancer, and it was a low-grade prostate cancer, I would take the Polaris test. Uh, the one problem is, of course, this is expensive. This costs 2,000 bucks at least, if not more. So this is an expensive test, which is currently being aggressively marketed in the United States, and I think it'll, it'll come over here soon. But it's certainly one of the major successes, I think, of the transatlantic prostate group and where it's going. So transatlantic prostate group didn't uh, finish there, and along came TAPG2, as we call it. TAPG2 was another 1,000 cases, or 989, as I think it's turned out in the end. I couldn't face doing it on my own this time. So fortunately, I had uh, Louis Beltran, my, my close colleague uh, at, at Barts in the London, to uh, help me to do it. And Lewis went through exactly the same stage as I went through in it, and saying, oh my God, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? And uh, eventually the results came out well. But this is, but, uh, cohort is slightly different. We're basing it on biopsies, which is how we currently diagnose prostate cancer. And again, we've, we've separately analysed 6,000 cores of tissue. And uh, the first data emerged last year. And uh, as if it isn't enough, Jack's already made uh, a start on TAPG3, and Paul Lewis has already started looking at the TAPG3 data. So um, I haven't heard of TAPG4 yet, uh, Jack, but I'm, I'm waiting uh, where we go. So where does all that fit in with patient information? The problem with uh, the patient information is that we're currently giving patients the wrong information. The Gleason score, as I said, runs from 2 to 10. But basically, six is the lowest you can get. Now, as a man, if you go into a clinic with prostate cancer, and here you are told you have a grade six cancer on a scale that runs from two from 10, you're not gonna be that happy. You're not gonna be that happy. And you might say, oh, I'll have radical surgery, or I'll have a, a, a bigger operation than in fact I need. Whereas in fact, Gleason six is the lowest you can get. You're not gonna get anything less than that these days. So basically what you need to do is, as I suggested, is reinvent the system. And in the past six months, uh, well, six months ago in Chicago, they locked 60 pathologists in a room in Chicago, and we fought about this endlessly uh, until we came up with, with a solution for it. And the solution is basically uh, this. This is, it's hopefully going to be called the International Society of Urological Pathology, the ISAP grading system, uh, but we're arguing over the name still at the moment. <laughs> Um, but Gleason score six will be a gr group one. Three plus fours will be grade two. Strangely, you might think four plus threes will be grade three. Uh, score eights will be grade four, and nine to tens will be grade five. Well, the problem is that we've no uh, people try to have been trying to sort of justify this, and they've been using their radical prostatectomy data from other institutions to try and show that this works. But it was raised at the Chicago meeting that no one had uh, death statistics to go with this. No one actually had knew whether this worked with prostate cancer death. Except, of course, I realized that with TAPG2, we had this data. And so uh, we presented only three weeks ago, uh, Lewis presented at our meeting in Boston, the TAPG3 prostate cancer death by Gleason score data. And this is data that's very hot off the press in that you can see the prognostic grade ones do extremely well, 
and the prognostic grade fives um, do very badly. And apart from a slight blip there, that I'm sure we'll ma massage out with statistical massaging. Uh, no, joking. Uh, uh, that, uh, is, it, it, they do, they, these curves do separate. It separates nicely into five, uh, five Gleason groups. So this is the only evidence that we have that uh, prostate, this five-tier system actually does predict uh, prostate cancer death in 10, 15 years. So it's important data, and my, my job uh, when I finish this lecture next week uh, one of my jobs will be to uh, finalise this paper uh, to get it out. So um, I think this is important not just for me but for the, for the clinicians to uh, understand that to give decent information to the patient that they can comprehend because I don't think the Gleason system currently fulfils that. In my final seven, eight minutes, I want to talk a little about pathology uh, in 2015 and beyond, leaving prostate cancer uh, behind. Uh, now, uh, this comes to one aspect of my character that I think has to be brought out in this lecture uh, that many of you will know about. I'm a wincy bit accident prone. <laughs> and uh, uh, Scott couldn't resist taking this photo here. Unfortunately, Professor Domizio can't be here today, uh, but uh, she well remembers uh, the uh, pathology Christmas party in about 1995 when I managed to break my arm dancing with her. <laughs> and uh, Pro Professor Lowe took me to casualty on that occasion. And I've proceeded to uh, fall off whaling boats, fall down mountains, fall off everything, burn myself, do the lot ever since. Uh, so uh, looking forward for me, all I can say is I, I'm from now on, this is the moment I will be less accident prone, I promise you. I will, I will do my best not to be uh, uh, such a klutz anymore. I, I don't guarantee that one, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, pathology in the future, I think a number of scientists especially are very gleefully tell me the end of pathology is nigh. I've been hearing it for a while, I don't believe the end of pathology is benign. This is uh, my, the representation I found on the internet of a pathological brain with all things associated with it. But we won't be just dealing with morphology anymore. Apart from the chemical aspects, we should also be dealing with, with fish and various translocate fishes, uh, for essence and such a hybridisation, looking at various translocations and possibly even molecular data and detail as well. And we are basically the curators of tissue. And it is our role to curate and interact with everyone so that the clinician is presented with a, uh, a comprehensive assessment of the whole field of abnormalities in the tumour. I think we're already doing it in, in some fields. I think um, I work closely as well with Marianne uh, Grantham, who I, I hope is here, uh, at, who on testicular pathology, where apart from my morphological assessments, we, we also do molecular assessments as well on difficult cases and give the result to clinician in a synthesized form. And I think that's a way forward in many tumors. Similarly, in endocrine, we've been taking uh, leaps in, since we found out that some tumours have specific genetic mutations, we've been taking a leap forward in using immunochemistry and synthesising our molecular and morphological approaches. So pathology is not dead, but we do have to change with the time and change to our audience. And I do believe that we have a sort of um, interaction here. It's a two-way street. I think too often this is what happens. Pathologist says something that goes to the clinician and that's that. It should be a two-way street. And I'm perfectly prepared to get hassled by the clinicians. I think, uh, to be fair, I think it's the endocrinologists who hassle me more than anyone else over things. And, and quite rightly, too, I do appreciate it. Honestly, he said for gritted teeth. <laughs> and uh, I think we also have that interaction with scientists. We can learn from each other in providing information that they don't know and working with them. And I, although maybe pathology won't be in the forefront of the new molecular transformation, we are facilitators of it and should act closely with them to do it. Apart from that, I drew this and thought there's more than that. I think we do have a role in advocacy, uh, first of all with patients and secondly uh, with the government uh, to try and advocate for pathology and the need for it and to explain to patients the need for decent, high-quality pathology in this country. So I think there is a four-way aspect to how a pathologist should be acting and we should be, be central to it. Um, to be slightly serious for, for a minute, I, I do have a, this Jewish prayer. My family might be very surprised to hear in front of my microscope, and I ho hope some of my clinicians occasionally read it. It does uh, say some great words of, of wisdom. Give me the merit to regard every suffering person who comes to ask for advice as a human being 
without distinction between rich and poor, friend and foe, good person and bad, when a person is in stress, show me the only the human being. And it's a reminder to me, I hope, that even though I'm looking at a fairly divorced slide, there is a patient and a story behind uh, that uh, anonymous bit of tissue in front of me at the moment. Um, that is one thing behind my microscope. Unfortunately, the other thing behind the microscope when they get bored with, with the serious bit is I do have a, that poster uh, behind my microscope as, as well that talks a bit more about what I do. Um, so so to, to finish up, um, this is uh, me and Scott, my partner. This is with my, my, uh, my great niece, who, who's now four, um, Abigail. Um, and um, this is a bit of a momentous week for those of you who don't know. Not only have I managed to fit my inaugural week, uh, inaugural lecture this week, but on Monday, uh, Scott and I are going for panel for final approval uh, for adoption. So uh, we have a bit of a major week in many ways, uh, and in four weeks, um, those uh, late lines and a weekend might be a thing of the long, long past. <laughs> um, I've always got to say, this is, this is uh, the most current team I could find. Unfortunately, sat my tissue bank uh, manager is, uh, um, um, ha has a baby uh, born two, two months ago and so can't be here. And we've had uh, Rayhan, unfortunately, is not on this picture, but that's my, my, my current uh, tissue team employed uh, by Orchids and a couple of other grants. And I'm extremely grateful uh, to them for their hard work and, um, and for Orchid for all the support they've given my research group um, in the past. Um, finish, I've got a lot of thank yous to give, but obviously the urologists, endocrinologists, radiologists, and especially my fellow orchid researchers, Tim, uh, Yongji Lu, who I work with very closely from a molecular aspect, uh, and Tom Poles, who was obviously only in this, this, uh, this, this hot seat a few months ago, uh, works closely together on, on renal cancer, and of course Jonathan Shamash, who I've worked very closely with for 15 years now, especially on, on testis in prostate cancer. So I'm very grateful for their support. All the urologists at Bart's Health, um, endocrinologists, radiologists, and all my, the collaborators who work with me uh, nationally. And I'll finish uh, with the final strange loop of prostate cancer and a conundrum that I don't think we've yet solved, but is on my mission to try and help with. Is cure necessary in prostate cancer for those for whom it is possible? And is cure possible in those for whom it is necessary? Thank you very much. saying to Daniel that uh, <coughs> in the context of being accident prone, he needs to be seated very carefully in his new professorial <laughs> chair. That's a joke from Nick, by the way. Um, look, as I anticipated, I think as all of us anticipated, what a wonderful inaugural lecture. Um, it, I think, does define what these occasions are about, an opportunity to not only educate us a little as to areas perhaps we're not um, intimately aware of, um, but ne nevertheless to do so in a way that's truly accessible, uh, but also to recognise that for most of the things that we do, there are many folk who are behind what it is that we seek to achieve. So I think you've done that wonderfully well, and in a way that I feel we all um, should appropriately recognise. Now, by tradition, we don't invite questions um, at inaugural lectures, but we do have an alternative arrangement, and that is we invite you all to come and join us for some refreshment, um, which is going to be on the, in the Shield, sorry, um, which will, you'll, there'll be folk will direct you, but it's just the building uh, 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 opposite here. Um, please do come and join us. There's an opportunity, obviously, then for you to speak with and, and congratulate uh, Dan on, on his uh, achievement um, as now a uh, honorary professor here at Queen Mary and one that I think truly does recognise substantial achievement over an extended period of time. So uh, perhaps the only other thing I might say is to wish both you and Scott well in your further adventures. I've got one little bit of advice. You may perhaps for that panel choose to take your Jewish prayer and not the poster. <laughs> <that you have. laughs>
<laughs> so with that, again, sincere congratulations, Professor. <laughs>